Magandang araw sa inyong lahat. This is Rosella Reagan para sa Usapang Pera at Negosyo. Now, I'm, I'm so honored na naimbitahan natin itong ating guest ngayon kasi siya ay lagi ko lang nakikita pagdating sa mga, alam mo yun, nagja-judge ng beauty contest, speaker sa about environment, about being green, and uh, it's really an honor to have on the show Mr. Greenman Mathias. How are you? Hi, Ma'am Roselle. Great to see you. And uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Greetings from San Pablo City, Laguna. So you're from the South. Thank you so much for being here on GKTV. The topic that we would like to discuss today would be about money and business. And we hope that we can get some knowledge and some sharing of experiences from you. Now, my first question um, how do I call you? Green man, Mr. Green man. My, sure. first, <laughs> my first question is maybe you can give us a background of yourself and what you've been busy doing these days. Yeah, I come from a very small German village, a small barangay with only oh. 500 people. And uh, when I grew up, I already knew that I wanted to do something good for the planet. When my late father asked me, son, what job you want to pick up? I told him that my job will to save the planet. And he was shocked. He said, <laughs> son, that's not a job. You can't make money from hugging trees. Get a proper job. So, you know, I kind of uh, took that in. But my intuition was telling me that's my path. I got to find a way to make it work. So I continued that. I studied chemistry and then a master in environmental science. And uh, there we go. Then found my path into there are opportunities, but you need to create them. There are no standard jobs with that kind of uh, degree. Like, you know, people think, oh, I need to do engineering or accounting or medicine because there are very clear job profiles when you are an accountant. But healing the planet is something where you have to find your own niche. You have to identify your own path. And that's what I did. And um, yeah, it keeps me busy. And it keeps me busy with something that is meaningful. I am helping my kids, future generation. I'm doing what I'm really passionate about. So that's why for me, work is not really work. It's aligned with my passion. And that's why it kind of keeps me happy. And I'm still busy despite the pandemic. Maybe you'll never get tired healing the planet. There's so many things to heal in our planet. Are you going to stay here for a very long time? What's what's the plan? You mean you see a lot of foreigners in the Philippines? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We, we love the Philippines because uh, uh, the Philippines is, uh, uh, or, you know, we know this, it's more fun in the Philippines, right? That's what brings people here. It's, uh, the Philippines has got amazing biodiversity, beautiful islands, uh, blessed uh, 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 creation. And I think we uh, love to experience that as foreigners. And then uh, a lot of the guys fall in love with a, a <laughs> Philippines lady. So my, my uh, darling Marianne is the ultimate reason why I stayed here. So, um, you know, follow your heart and settle where your heart takes you. And that's why I'm in the Philippines for good. Yes, we might travel to other countries. Yes, we might go to Germany to look after my mom for a while. But I think uh, long term, uh, the Philippines will be our um, base and um, location. Yes. Wow. Send my regards to Mary Ann. Um, sure, we'll do. We'll do. You know, uh, sh she's a good friend. Now, um, considering the income of being Mr. Green Man, like I, I, I want to ask you, in healing the planet, how do you exactly earn? I mean, what, how, how do you make an income out of it and, you know, uh, sustain your family, sustain mm. your, your, your kind of lifestyle? And uh, how, how do you do it? What are yeah. the sources of income? I mean, the first thought that people have in mind is, oh, you're going to be working for an NGO and uh, NGO salaries are usually very modest. And this is as well a uh, perception that I had. I started uh, when myself, obviously, with my late father must have been thinking, oh, I'm going to hack trees. I'm going to, you know, 
protect the trees and that will be a, a, a very low paid job if you ever even get any money for it. And I started an NGO in Malaysia or a movement called Eco Warriors Malaysia, peaceful, non-business, we just help the planet. And one of uh, my uh, volunteers there, she told her parents that she wanted to study this environmental science subject. And her parents said, no, uh, we're not going to give you the permission because you'll be working for NGOs and you'll be poor all your life. <laughs> so this perception, classically. But there are many, many different ways of how you can actually help the planet and uh, have a job or be your own boss, have your business. I mean, when I started, after I did my master's, I was in the UK and I was looking around for jobs and I kind of realized, oh, there are a lot of different typical jobs. One is working for a wastewater treatment company, uh, then there are consulting companies. And I was looking around, but um, I, I wrote to this water company. I never even got a reply. But then I met this professor from a university and he said, oh, what you are doing, I need you to help me on my project. I don't have much money. I can't pay you much, but the project is great and you will learn a lot. I looked at the project and I, I thought, yes. This is exactly the project that will give me international exposure, help me to work with companies, and it will give me the opportunity to refine my skills. When you graduate, you don't yet have the skills that you need in life to work with businesses and stuff like that, unless you're a superwoman or a superman. And um, so I took that researcher job. It was more like a PhD research job. Uh, I quickly realized I'm not the kind of guy to do a PhD, but I loved working with these companies and it was just enough money to get by and survive. But what I did was I learned from the project, I learned from the companies, and it was an EU-funded project on environmental management with small and medium-sized companies. And I learned from some of the experts in the project, they were leading experts in the subject. And suddenly I was seen as an expert as well. And suddenly mm -hmm. I realized companies want to work with me directly. So I resigned my job at the university and I was working as a like a sole trader, doing my thing, traveling around the world already. I was just like less than 30 years old. I just graduated two years earlier, but suddenly, wow, people considered me an expert. I mean, mm -hmm. what I realized as well is I'm not a scientist even though I studied science. Mm -hmm. My passion is not in being in the lab and cooking up some chemicals, but my strength is communication and articulation. I realized that when I was with my professor in Indonesia, what happened? We were doing a five-day training course on environmental management for mm -hmm. Indonesian business people and uh, university staff. And then there was this lady from the government who told me, wow, what you are an expert in, we need that all over Indonesia. We want you to travel and we have money from the German government to pay you. And two or three of the participants there in that conference told me, hey, you know what? All the things you are talking about, we understand, we get it. But what your professor is talking about, it goes in here, it goes out there. We don't understand this guy. It's like somewhere up there in the clouds. And then I realized, wow, my biggest skill is actually clear articulation, storytelling, inspiring people, giving them a clear message how they can do it. Okay, you go green, think about your electricity bill, your water bill. It costs you money. It's not just the waste that you are getting rid of. And you Indonesians are telling me you can get rid of it free of charge. Okay. But have you considered how much of money of the raw material that you bought has gone into the waste is the hidden cost that you're throwing away? If you are producing a lot of waste, you're inefficient. Your yield is not good. That means a lot of the money on employing people, on uh, paying for electricity, paying for water, paying for raw material. That's the hidden cost of waste. If you have too much waste, you will become lazy and uncompetitive as a business. It pays to go green, to become efficient, to reduce your electricity bill. So 
clear and simple messages that are business relevant then made me become, you know, well known. I got invited to all sorts of conferences. I was running an event in the UK and I was trying to sell uh, a software for environmental management. Okay. I had a lot of big companies there, but I sold zero. My sales on that day were zero. A guy came up to me and said to me, you know what? My friend told me I have to meet you. The, you know, I was already kind of well known in this. I was a brand at that time for ISO 14001 environmental management systems. And this guy basically told me, you know what, Matthias, your sales pitch sucked. It wasn't good. You are not a natural salesman. And I said, yeah, you're right. Because I'm a guy who wants to save the planet. I don't want to sell stuff to people. I am passionate about saving the planet. And then this guy told me, but you know what? The fact that all these big companies came to this godforsaken place in the middle of nowhere just to listen to you, that is amazing. Let me do the sales. Let me do the deals because that is my skill. I'd never met this guy before. It was the first time I spoke with this guy. Some other guy that I knew had asked him to go there and talk with me. But what he said made sense. And then he offered me, hey, let's start a business. We base it around your brand. You're already very well known in the UK. The newspapers are asking you for interviews. The conferences want you. Let me be the sales guy who put the deals together and who does the actual deal. And I thought it makes sense. Why not? I focus on what I'm good at, communication, speaking, articulation. And we started a business a week later with zero money down. We only used our laptops. We didn't pay ourselves a salary for the first three months. And this business took off like a rocket. Already in the first month, I did a talk at a big conference. A listed huge company came to me and said, you know what, Matthias? The problem you just said is exactly the problem that we have got. Can you help us to solve that problem? And that's a tip for you guys out there. If you are good at articulating a problem, then usually you can attract people to come to you and they will be happy to pay you money if you solve their problem. So what I talked about was exactly the problem they had. I talked about how when you implement environmental management systems the wrong way, what happens when it doesn't work? And he said, that's what we are doing. Help us to put it right. So I talked with the guy. We had a good rapport. And then I told him, here's my business partner, Mark O'Reilly. He's the commercial director of the company. you got to talk with him. Now, to cut a long story short, they became buddies. They went out clubbing. Uh, two weeks later, uh, this guy from a big company signed a deal with a mobilization payment, that was what my business partner negotiated. I would have never dared to put that in a contract. I would have never even had that idea. The mobilization payment was 25,000 pounds sterling. We were a startup company. We, hadn't, we had just only opened up our bank account. We hadn't even done any minute of work for that company. And we had 25,000 pounds on our bank account already. How much is that? 25,000 pounds. I think it's like... Um, it was huge. Yeah, it's like uh, 1.5 million pesos, right? Mm -hmm. Something Or 1.8 million pesos before we even started the work. So that was the cash flow for our company. I would not have been able to pull this off. I would have not even dared to do that. But mm -hmm. sometimes you need to work with the right people with the complementary skills. So the way it basically worked was... I was the brand, I was the authority in the field, but the deals were being made by my business partner who had the right, you know, style, touch and rapport building with the clients. And he was able to package it up in mm -hmm. a proposal. And uh, we took off like a rocket. We uh, expanded the business. We had 100% of the equity between the two of us because we... <coughs> With this deal, we didn't need external investment. We grew organically and we started the company in April 99. And on the 1st of January 2001, I still remember that 
after a three month negotiation period, I signed the deal to sell our business to a listed engineering company with an earnout deal. Okay. And we both made good money from that, not enough to retire on the spot, but, um, you know, uh, for something where we just chipped in our laptops, none of our money, we created money out of nothing over a three year period and both walked away with a, with a very nice check. So, I mean, we had to commit to work three years with that company that acquired us because this is basically a business that is based on connections, uh, uh, knowledge, branding, and uh, market positioning. It's not like an asset-based business where if the uh, key people walk away, it will run smoothly. But we had a three-year year transition period. So, um, yeah, that's how with the right complementary person working mm -hmm. together. And business is sometimes not just about you alone. It's about, you know, how can you get the right person working together with you? And there are problems working together with other people. Sometimes you don't agree on things. And it was the same in our business. Actually, one of the reasons why we decided to sell the business was because we were getting too big for our old office. We were arguing about, you know, shall we buy our own office? Where shall we move? Uh, blah, 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 blah. There were other things that we didn't always agree on. And we came to the conclusion, okay, we've created an asset that's worth something. People are, are sniffing around us. Let's sell the business to a big boy who wants to put some money into us. So it, it worked out nicely. Most of the time, you know, uh, when I interview some businessmen, they say that if you can do it yourself, it is better. To have a partner, it, it's something that you really have to consider because at the end of the day, you might have this conflict and you might have this uh, argument along the way and eventually break the, the, the friendship or the relationship. Did, did that happen to you? Like, you know, are you still in good friends with the previous partner that you had? We were basically uh, partners and bonded together by our joint goal of uh, supporting the value that we had created. I wouldn't say that we were like uh, super duper friends. And I mean, we didn't start off like being super duper friends. We started off with this guy coming out of nowhere and saying, hey, I can do this for you. And my int intuition told me, yes, let's do it. And I mean, it wasn't like I had uh, invested loads of money into my brand. Uh, I was just, my brand was built up automatically. But I'd realized, wow, well, I've had a great time. I've been traveling all over the world. You know, I, I was in my 20s and I was suddenly getting well known in this industry. But at the end of the year, I was looking back and I hadn't made any big money. I had kind of, you know, made enough money to live comfortably, but it wasn't like I'm swimming in money. And when this guy said, and, and I, I had made this big event and I sold, sold zero software. So I kind of felt, uh, that this combination could be powerful. And later on, I attended a training where people were talking about different profiles. And that profile is, is called Wealth Dynamics Profiling System. And when I did it, I realized I'm in this position of, you know, the brand, the ambassador, uh, the guy that can, you know, turn up on stage and, and people listen. And the other guy was in the category of deal maker. So these two people working together and then together with people who are very diligent, very detailed. The first two guys we recruited were people who were actually doing the work, who were writing the reports, who were really going into the technical detail. We intuitively recruited the right guys. And all of these guys, my former partner and one of the two guys that we recruited were on a Zoom call uh, uh, three weeks ago before Christmas when we did a virtual reunion of that old company. So we are still in touch. We haven't been in touch for years. We were making loads of jokes about those days. And uh, yes, we are still in very good terms. But I'm not sure whether I would want to start a business again with Mark, even though he's a good guy. But there were some aspects about our collaboration that were stressful, where we didn't agree on things. And, you know, 
where uh, uh, we were kind of close to falling out. But the fact that we had created value and we had a joint business was pulling us together. And the fact that we sold it to a listed engineering company. And when you have an earnout deal, the performance that you're getting over the next one or two years, depending on the uh, period defined in the deal, is going to determine how much that company that's taken you over is going to pay you. So it was very important that we stuck to our task and uh, it all worked out, even though there were some major risks. I mean, we had one project that was suffering from politics. It was an EU funded project. It was partially funded by the UK government. The project was a headache. And I remember I had to get up in the middle of the night, take a train down to London to defend the project in front of a panel of experts because my business partner, uh, I felt had screwed up the relationship with the other people and they were like so angry with us that I had to, to get down there uh, in a UK government building and I had to basically, I was on the spot, I had to save our position in the project and had to explain to the others what had gone on. So, you know, there were very stressful moments. There were pivotal moments where, you know, you had to basically be on your toes and and keep the thing together from suddenly everything evaporating. And when it's not completely in your control, it's tough. But that's the reality sometimes in life. And you just got to buckle up. If you can do it all by yourself, great. But who is in the position of doing it all by themselves? Yes, if you've got a lot of money to buy in the expertise for the different aspects of a business. But it's very unlikely that you as an individual, if you start a new business, might have all the skills that are required to make this business very, very effective from day zero. Uh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Or maybe if you have, uh, if you decide to have a partnership, then the majority of the share should be on your part. I mean, so that you can decide and you can, you know, uh, you'll have the higher voting percentage over the other partners. Yes, actually, the way we did it in that business was in the articles of association. And I have to admit, you know, I, I, I am not a, a classical business person. I'm not the shrewd guy that, you know, <laughs> has got everything sorted out with the articles of association. And uh, Mark, my business partner, basically said, okay, you can have the majority share of the uh, uh, business because it will be mainly based on your existing brand. And that is of a lot of value. But I want us to write into the articles of association that we have joint decision-making power. So we both have to agree on things. And maybe retrospectively looking at it, considering that we grew the business so fast, so quickly, and in less than two years of starting the company, we sold it, it was the right thing to do because it kept us together. It kept us focused on the task. And we had to find a compromise that we both agreed on. So, you know, if it's your business, you have started it, it's your baby. You have invested a lot of time, intellectual property into it. Yes, you should keep the majority share. But if it's something in between like that scenario, even though I had the majority of the physical shares, the equity in the business, but we wrote that into the Articles of Association, and I think it kept us together. If I would have had more power over him to decide, he might have walked away. And this is as well important psychologically. You know, if you have oh. two kind of equal <laughs> partners, how do you manage that both are happy? Retrospectively, I realized my business partner at some point was suffering from the fact that I was getting all the glory. Mm -hmm. Right? When you, are the, when you are the brand of the company, you are the guy that's on stage, you mm -hmm. know, People are applauding and you are the one that get, gets the applaud. Great speech, you know, wow, you know, or, or great video. And he was trying to become a speaker as well, but it wasn't really his, his core 
uh, uh, strength and passion. But retrospectively, I realized there might have been a, a period where some of his frustration was based on the fact that I wasn't giving him enough public recognition for his role. So it's as well about understanding what everybody is bringing to the table. Only later on, a couple of years later, when I listened to this talk about this profiling system, and I understood my profile is like that, and he is the deal maker. The deal maker is so critical to the success of the business. But at that time, I wasn't so conscious about that critical importance of the success, even though I was seeing and experiencing it in front of my eyes. But, you know, later on, you realize, actually, mm -hmm. you know, because those people like myself, we are just going to do it, whether we make big money or not. But if you have the right deal maker with you, you know, the money might be several times bigger that you can get out of something because there's something that knows the magic recipe of how to cut the deal. You are a great speaker. How did you learn it? I learned it in church when oh. I was running a Christian youth group. And even in school, at that time, I was a man on a mission. I felt empowered. This is my, my job to do. And even though I still remember, I was like really worried and nervous about giving a talk in public because I came from a small barangay. That barangay is the last barangay <laughs> in that area. It's like I was the first guy from that barangay to go to that school and succeed in that school. So it's like, you know, uh, you, you feel like you are not there with the elite. And uh, you're just from that little barangay that everybody thinks is like uh, behind the curtain, you know, and, and the people who come from there are a couple of years behind everybody else. So, um, and there was this thinking, oh, yeah, you know, um, I'm just from that little barangay. And, uh, but I was so empowered being a man on a mission, uh, oh. you know, giving a speech in front of the whole school. Uh, even though I was kind of not that confident about it initially. And mm -hmm. just building up that confidence in uh, uh, the Christian youth group was the first step. And then later on, when I was doing this research with the professor and I picked up my first lousily paid job, but very valuable job because of all the things I learned, I was a part-time lecturer as well. And that again helped greatly because I could give uh, uh, lectures in front of students and build up my confidence more in that field on a bigger stage. So, you know, look for opportunities where you can be a speaker. Nowadays, those opportunities are unlimited. You can start your own channel on YouTube. You can start your own, you know, thing on Facebook. You can use StreamYard, whatever else. Unlimited possibility for you to build up that confidence and experience is here on our fingertips. It was different in those days. It was the physical presentations. But yeah, my part-time lecturing at university was a good training ground for me to build up more and more. And then later on, I realized, wow, you know, uh, I have a natural skill with this. This is intuitively one of my strengths. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can refine it further, but the basic intuition, the basic ability to articulate is there. And what initially seemed like my biggest weakness, I'm not a native speaker. And actually, when I lived in the barangay, I had never met a foreigner. I had never spoken with a foreigner in my whole life. When I was in school in English, it was my worst subject. Why? Because my mind was telling me, I don't need it. Hindi ko my intindi han. You know, I don't speak any English. I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't want to learn this language. My English teacher knew I was lazy. She would pick on me. And I had the worst grade ever in my school certificate was in English. I had a five. Those who know the German school system, if you have a five, it's very bad. If you have two fives in two subjects in a year, you are not allowed to pass. 
we call it sitzen bleiben, stays in your seat. You have to repeat the whole year. So I nearly was faced with that destiny because of my very bad grades in English. So if you're listening out there and you're very bad in the subject, there is hope for you because <laughs> it might be a change of mindset. Later on when I realized, wow, this is opening the international door. This is giving me the opportunity to talk with the whole world. I changed my mindset. I changed my motivation. English is my biggest asset. And because I have a slow way of articulating, a clear way of articulating, that's why the people in Indonesia were telling me, we can understand you, but we, can't, we cannot understand this British professor. Both yeah. his accent and his way of thinking is too difficult to understand. And after I got this comment, I realized, wow, you know, seems like I'm good giving these training courses. I've got to do more of it. Mm -hmm. So you become overnight a trainer or a speaker. You can call yourself a speaker or a trainer, right? There is no specific um, professional qualification. Everybody can become a speaker or a trainer. And if you get very good at it, and if people really want you, you can ask them, okay, pay me a thousand US dollars for the talk or even more, depending on the marketplace, depending on the branding, possible can happen. Yeah, speaking of uh, the rates of a speaker like you, like what would be the range of what, what was the lowest that you got and the highest that you were able to generate uh, from being a speaker or a trainer? Yeah, uh, in, in, in this industry, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I give a lot of talks for free. Why? Because... It's about my passion. It's about saving the planet. I know that NGOs can't pay me a big fee. Valang problema. I will do a, a, you know, a nice talk for passionate people that want to save the planet without charging for it. But if a big company wants to hire me uh, for a motivational talk for their employees, I mean, okay, during the pandemic, I gave people discounts uh, and stuff like that as well. It's much easier for me to give a talk here uh, uh, via uh, the internet. It's much cheaper for me. I don't waste time traveling around. I have more time with my family and I can give a discount. So really the sky is the limit. Uh, it can range, you know, giving a talk uh, for $100, $1,000, $5,000, uh, anything is possible. If you're a super duper branded speaker uh, in a more commercial subject than saving the planet, like mm -hmm. sales or uh, um, marketing, customer uh, um, related stuff, and you do a, a talk at a big sales conference, you know, mm -hmm. I have American friends that are uh, famous speakers in the US, they charge $10,000. Or wow. fifteen thousand dollars for one talk. It might be a one-hour talk. So I have not reached those levels. But you know, one of the trends that we can see in this industry is uh, the environment and social and sustainability issues are becoming more and more important through investors. There is this ESG trend: environment, social governance. More and more fund managers are picking listed companies based on the environment, social governance. More and more jobs are opening up in that field. It's becoming huge. Sustainability reporting. Even here in the Philippines, listed companies have been told by the SEC um, that they should prepare sustainability reports. The SEC has uh, issued sustainable reporting guidelines. They're publicly available. You can Google them in 2019. So last year was the first year that nearly all listed companies have published sustainability reports. This is a huge industry. The ESG rating agencies, even some of my Facebook friends, young Filipinos, are working for these rating agencies. Those are great jobs with huge potential. You work for those guys for two or three years time, you know the subject well, you can start your own consultancy, you can start your own training. And 
you know, generate much more income. Uh, what are the saving tips that you can give us? Yeah, for me, it's less about the physical aspects of saving the cash and putting it in a separate account uh, to then later on have that uh, passive income or that the funds that actually uh, help you in the future to retire early and to retire comfortably. My strategy is equity, building up equity in businesses. Um, I used some of the money that I made from selling that business to co-found another business in Germany, a green building materials company. So I have equity in there. My pension system is an eco-friendly uh, pension system, sustainable forest plantation in Panama that are biodiverse. There are eight different species on a one hectare plot. There are animals. Some trees will be harvested and money will come in and they will be replanted, but it ne will never be clear cut. So that is my sustainable pension system. And now I'm using my brand during the pandemic. I have ramped that up to build up additional equity in other businesses. My target is in total to have eight equity stakes in eight different businesses. So I'm not focused on saving financial cash. I'm focused on saving by equity in other businesses. That is my strategy for a uh, comfortable passive income. The German business is already paying a nice dividend every year, uh, mm -hmm. but it's already in existence since 2007. But uh, the forest in Panama uh, hasn't yet paid out any major biz money, even though it's already existing since 15 years. But I knew 20, year 2025, that's where the big money is coming. So okay. sometimes you need to keep an eye on cash flow. But my strategy is not, okay, save $1,000 here, $1,000 there. My strategy is safe by having equity stakes in promising businesses that can either do an IPO or pay you a nice dividend so that there comes a point in time where you can say, okay, I don't need to be worried about cash flow at all in terms of working for it because it's coming in automatically, passively. Other people do real estate. I just decided that my thing is equity stakes in businesses that heal the planet, that are eco-friendly, that do mm -hmm. good for Mother Earth. That's where I'm putting my emphasis in. For example, I'm uh, uh, just, I signed a contract in August last year during the height of the pandemic with an Australian startup. It's a new mega mall concept. It will be an eco-friendly mega mall concept. I'm the eco ambassador for that mall and I have an equity stake in it. And, you know, I think it could be quite realistic that that business uh, does an IPO in, uh, you know, next year, the year after or something else or gets a big offer to be taken over by a large player. Who knows, you know, maybe one day Amazon spots this uh, 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 online mega mall that's ramping up internationally. So that is more my focus now. Rather than physically saving cash, it's building up equity in different uh, businesses and then getting uh, passive uh, income from that. And then you mentioned also earlier during the pre-interview about the wealth creation. Like, uh, can you explain more about this? That uh, is it a training? Is it a seminar? Is it something that you promote? I I, I promote wealth that is healing the planet. Uh, I always talk about this concept, let's make a living from healing the planet. Classically, our wealth creation models have been based on exploiting the planet. You know, digging out oil and gas, coal or limestone, uh, uh, which is the raw material for cement, has often been destructive to the planet. Now, we need to continue that for some period of time, but we need to shift more to wealth creation that has a healing impact on the planet. So we need to decarbonize because CO2 is the long-term threat, uh, COVID is the short-term threat, 
but uh, uh, carbon dioxide and other related global warming gases are the long-term threat to our human presence on the planet. The planet will self-generate. Uh, we have seen that partially during the uh, COVID period when we were stuck at home, suddenly the skies are clear. Uh, planet Earth has self-generation, but it might be that the human species on this planet will face extinction if we do not change for a more healing uh, um, wealth creation. So we need to create wealth in harmony with Mother Earth. That is very, very important, sustainable wealth from treating the soil in, in, in a harmonic way, not doing monoculture, not doing clear cutting of biodiverse forests. Um, we need to think about the future. So there are concepts like agroforestry. Uh, my friend Cherry Atelano at Agrea is doing a good job in helping uh, farmers to be more sustainable, have higher value crops that are more friendly to the planet. You know, we need to really come up with sustainable wealth creation that's sustainable for us humans and sustainable for Mother Earth at the same time. That's great. So nice to hear that. Um, Matthias, last words from you. Uh, any invitation to our audience or anything that they need to uh, watch out for? Any seminar or training that you have in line? First of all, I would like to say thanks, uh, uh, Mam Roselle, for the interview today. I hope that people learned and got some inspiration. Stick with your passion, but find a way how you can monetize it. Become great in a niche, then people will come to you and you can set the price that is associated with your brand. Every two weeks time, I do a, a podcast on sustainable pH. Tune into that. The next one is this coming, uh, uh, not this Saturday, but the Saturday after with Miss Earth Phili Philippines Roxy and Miss Earth Global Water. That will be an amazing podcast. Then search for the Green Minded podcast. We'll change the name soon. Uh, we have uh, with my friend Victor de la Casa from Subic. We have a regular podcast there. But believe in yourself and find a way how you can make a living from healing the planet. That, I think, should be something we should aspire for, for the sake of the beautiful Philippine, for nation building, and for the sake of our children, our future generations. We owe it for their good and healthy future to make the right changes now. Go green, go sustainable, be a healing impact for Mother Earth. Thank you for the inspiration, Green Matthias Gelber. Thank you for the time. I hope we'll have part two of this. And for everyone who watched, thank you so much. And uh, sa uulitin po, uh, abangan nyo yung aming mga iba pang series ng interviews na kung saan matututo kayo ng pagnenegosyo at yung mga tungkol sa pera. Maraming salamat po. See you again next time.